Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Today is March 19th. It is the third Monday of the month, which means it's time for a New York Workers' Compensation webinar. Our topic today is going to be penalties and no coverage exposure in New York. And this is really the end of our year-long webinar series. And this is when we tie it up and we talk about some of the downsides of the litigation process in New York and some of uh, the board's uh, proclivities to penalizing employers at every step of the way. Uh, this is completely live, as you could tell. <laughs> Am I not able to switch my uh, thing? This is totally live, so uh, please feel free to ask me questions as we go along. I can see them popping up on my screen, and at the end, I will try to answer as many questions as I can. We try to keep the webinar to just 30 minutes, uh, and so I'll try to save some time at the end so that we can do as many questions as possible. And you do not have to ask me questions on just today's topic, which is penalties and no coverage exposure. Please feel free to ask me questions about any topics or issues that are of interest to you. Um, all right, let's dive right into it. I hope everyone has received the handout for today's presentation. And I also included it today in the GoToWebinar um, presenter. You should be able to download it right now if you didn't receive it from me today via email, and maybe you're joining us a little late. In that handout is our handy chart of all of the most common penalties that there are in New York. Now, New York is a penalty-driven and penalty-heavy state. New York loves to penalize employers. Uh, if it wasn't for the fact that it's got one of the largest markets in the country, I'm certain that every single one of my uh, clients would not want to be doing business in New York because we have such a draconian and penalty-driven workers' compensation system here. Um, most of my clients will tell me that it's not their worst state for penalties, but certainly there are a lot of penalties in this state. And on average, the average uh, matter in New York is penalized for $300 uh, per year that the case is open. So just put that in perspective and you can take a look at your claims population and think about whether that's your high or your low. If you're low, great, you're doing something wonderful and I'd love to hear from you about some of your tips and tricks. Um, but the most common penalty we see is the one that I've put down on yellow in this chart, uh, which is the failure to file a requested report. New York loves to uh, hit your adjuster, your risk professional, uh, with requests for things. And these will appear by way of letters or notices to the employer or carrier. And then your risk professional will be given a certain period of time in, in order to respond. And typically, it will be asking for things like a wage statement. Uh, a, a statement of uh, similar worker earnings or something like that. And if your adjuster or your risk professional doesn't get it done or get it filed in time, you'll get whacked with this $50 penalty, which is the most common penalty in the system. Uh, New York has a number of other penalties that are out there uh, that whack us. And uh, the, some of the biggest are uh, failing to pay the award within 10 days of the entry of that order to pay. Um, other small, less uh, seen ones are those for frivolous adjournment. Notice that if your uh, attorney fails to appear for a hearing, you, the carrier or employer, will get whacked with a $1,000 fine. Uh, what happens if the uh, claimant's attorney doesn't appear for a hearing? Basically nothing. They just reset it down for another hearing. So a great example of how skewed against employers the penalty scheme is in New York. Um, New York also has, uh, had, in our April 2017 reforms, and our workers' compensation uh, law was changed dramatically in April of 2017, and the prior payer guidance, which had been issued by the board and actually was part of the regulations, has now been uh, adopted by the statute to state that the employer uh, has to pay uh, the uh, claimant uh, benefits within 18 days of disability, meaning day of lost time, or 10 days after the uh, employer has knowledge. And that will result in a $50 penalty. Uh, and if we fail to file the notice of controversy or begin payment within 10, within 10 days of the knowledge, there will be a $300 penalty. And in the past, when the board would impose those penalties, uh, we'd at least get a hearing on the issue. Uh, the 2017 reforms took away our ability to even get a hearing on that issue of payer compliance. All right, so let's talk quickly about some other common penalties. Uh, hardly a week goes by uh, that I do not get a phone call from a small employer in New York, and it's usually a mom and pop dry cleaner or gas station or uh, you know, uh, Quickie Mart that calls me and says, 
well, I just got this notice from the board. It says I owe them $60,000 in penalties because I didn't uh, show proof of coverage for this specified period of time. New York has a uh, very, very aggressive penalization program for employers who have a lapse in coverage, and there does not have to be a loss uh, or an injury reported during that period of time. I often contrast this with my uh, practice in New Jersey, where I don't think I've ever seen an employer penalized for failing to carry workers' compensation coverage for a period of time in New Jersey, where there wasn't an injury or an incident or some reason uh, for the Department of Labor and Division of Workers' Compensation to actually look into a case. Here, the board will investigate, and if there, it is determined that you did not have coverage, you'll get hit with these big penalties. Another common source of no coverage cases is those uh, people who have maybe a live-in nanny in their residence, or a mother's helper who comes in a certain amount of days a week, uh, or a nanny who just maybe doesn't live there but works 30, 40 hours a week in the home. And the nanny gets injured and has to bring a worker's comp claim. And all of a sudden, the homeowner realizes they owe $60,000, $100,000 worth of penalties for failing to carry worker's compensation coverage. So uh, in addition uh, to the uh, penalties, of course, is having to reimburse the uninsured employer's fund. All right. Uh, there are also some criminal um, implications for failing to carry coverage. And this really would apply to the employer who's had multiple uh, uh, brushes with the law where there's been uh, multiple employees, there's been some uh, incidents over time where they failed to have coverage or there's been determined to have multiple lapses of coverage uh, where there are some penalties that can come into play. Illegal employments. Uh, illegal employments uh, also generate a uh, uh, penalty to the employer and of course your illegal employee can uh, sue you directly and this is generally speaking uh, to discourage minors from being employed. This only applies to minors. Unfortunately, it does not apply to those pre-citizens or undocumented workers who we see so often. Uh, they do not then have a direct right of suit against the employer. There are some exceptions to employing min uh, minors and of course, things like baby shitters, uh, the, a kid who you pay every so often to shovel your walk when it snows. Uh, and then the act goes into some quite uh, specific ones, home farm work, bridge caddies at bridge tournaments, et cetera. The biggest penalty we see in New York, and really the most dangerous one, and the one that we spend a lot of our time trying to mitigate, uh, because it's worth it to mitigate, is the 25-3-F penalty. And that's the penalty for a settlement or a order to pay compensation, and it's usually permanent residual disability. So think of a loss of wage earning compensation settlement, uh, think of a scheduled loss of use settlement, or think of a Section 32 settlement, a lump sum dismissal settlement in this jurisdiction, in which the employer or carrier has failed to make the payment within 10 days of the notice of approval of the settlement. The uh, word for this is draconian. It is 20% of the total settlement. So your Section 32 case that you agreed to amongst the parties for a $100,000 lump sum dismissal and then had that approved by a law judge you could expect 18 days after that approval to get a notice of approval saying it's approved, and now you have 10 days to make that payment. If you fail, the claimant is due statutorily a 20% penalty on that $100,000 settlement. That's crazy, and the payment goes directly to the claimant. Um, and so what we have is a situation where we have a very strict statute. It's not based on, you, you can try to demonstrate some good faith reason uh, but really, in, historically, and according to the case law, the only really good faith reasons are things like you issued the check, but the claimant moved. You issued the check. It went to the claimant's correct address, but someone stole it. So you could prove you issued the check within time and it would have reached the claimant within time. Uh, these are, generally speaking, very outlier sort of examples or almost counter examples to what more typically happens. What more typically happens is uh, the attorney goes to court, comes back, says, okay, watch your mail. In 18 days, you're going to get a notice. And maybe the risk professional misses it and issues the check even a day late. Under our statute in New York, even a day late is going to generate that 20% penalty. It's really a windfall to the claimant. And you can be certain that claimant's attorneys are very happy for this to happen because, hey, they're going to get a fee. They're going to come into court and argue, hey, hey uh, th this person's due this money. Very difficult to overturn. Uh, what we've done in the past to try to sidestep this issue of the penalty is try to negotiate something with the claimant where the claimant will withdraw the claim for the penalty and instead will pay them an M&T. 
So in a case where we've got a section 32 for $100,000 and it would have moved perhaps $20,000 to the claimant as a penalty, you know, we'll call up our adversary and say, listen, we're going to torture you. We're going to appeal the determination. We're going to make a good faith argument that it wasn't our fault, uh, that this wasn't paid. And, you know, we really have to know we're going to we put up a big fight here. And sometimes our adversaries will say, fine, can you make an M&T offer to our client? And this is uh, really technically not supposed to be uh, a way of sidestepping the penalty. Uh, and you can make this M&T payment. We'll say it's a transportation reimbursement for $10,000. Let's say that would be very a very good outcome. Uh, the money gets issued directly to the claimant, and then they would withdraw their claim and, in fact, go to court and say, I'm not interested in the penalty. And that's the way that would work. Uh, but most of our adversaries are, have no real reason to agree to the M&T because the statute is strict and requires that 20% penalty to be paid to their client. So these are very, very, very dangerous uh, penalties. And uh, sometimes the, there, there may be a good faith reason, like a uh, carrier will say, well, my adjuster just missed it in the in e-case, the, the electronic docketing system, or the notice came, but maybe it went to our wrong office. The board doesn't care about any of that. Uh, and generally speaking, they will enforce that penalty. All right, there's another penalty that we see from time to time, and uh, you know, uh, it, it's, it's been used by the board to signal in a, uh, that they do not want to have too many appeals coming in, and this is the uh, penalty for a frivolous appeal. Uh, this penalty for $500 is payable to the claim. It's really meant to dissuade uh, appeals that are simply done for tactical purposes. Now, if you were here with us uh, uh, last month, I believe it was, we did appeals. Uh, you'll know that I do advocate the use of appeals for tactical purposes. And the reason for that is that in New York, when you file an appeal of the uh, trial level judge's decision, you get an automatic stay of the issue under appeal, which is typically the payment. So, uh, in, from my perspective, I consider them highly tactical. I will often file an appeal where truly we think there's a limited uh, maybe uh, chance that the case is ultimately going to be overturned on appeal. However, we'll do it simply to gain some leverage or some traction in, some, in a case. Um, the board will real, routinely penalize us for those appeals where they see that there really was no legal grounds or merit to the underlying appeal and that the appeal was done for tactical reasons. However, it may be a small price to pay for the opportunity to get eight or nine months of no payments going to the claimant and then using that opportunity uh, to try to negotiate or maneuver the case into the correct posture for a section 32 lump sum dismissal which is favorable to the carrier. And again, another example of where we would do this is where the board is going to impose a penalty of 20% on perhaps a settled case. You can go to court, have the judge order the 20% penalty, and then immediately appeal it, which then ties it up for eight or nine months. That's what's going to give you that leverage so that you can then go back to your adversary and say, hey, let's do this on an M&T. Let's not tie this thing up. What, wouldn't your guy be happy with $10,000 right now as opposed to $20,000 10 months from now? Uh, and then hopefully you've got to claim it with a low future time orientation who wants the money today. All right, uh, so that's kind of an overview of the appeal system, I'm sorry, the penalty system in New York and uh, really goes into much more depth in that handout. Uh, let's take a second now and see if I got any questions here. I'm hoping I got some interesting ones today uh, to go into. Okay, I got my cursor, questions, let's bring that panel out here. Ha. Okay, Michelle asks a great question. And I think, I think this is something to, to touch upon just briefly. What about when the claimant appeals for frivolous issues? Uh, interesting question, and, but it's pretty rare, to be frank with you, and here's why. Uh, we don't see that many claimant appeals. In fact, overwhelming, I would tell you, it's probably two-thirds of the appeals are filed by uh, the employers or the carriers. Probably only about a third of the appeals are filed by the claimants. The reason for that is they win most of the time. Uh, and then the idea of penalizing the claimant for a frivolous appeal, rarely done, if ever done. Uh, in those instances, I would imagine the claimant is trying to overturn a dismissal of their uh, case in chief, meaning the court saying you either have no ongoing disability or there was no injury, did not arise out of in the course of, or they're, they're simply not recovering. And they were appealing as sort of a Hail Mary to try to get some traction in their case uh, and maybe bring it back. But generally speaking, we don't see them being penalized for frivolous appeals, but that does speak to the sort of writ large uh, uh, issue in our penalty system in New York. It's almost all carrier pe uh, penalties. It's almost all employer penalties. 
there are very few penalties uh, that can accrue to the claimant. Uh, one of the only ones that has any teeth in it, and we do rely on this from time to time, is the, pen is the penalty on the claimant who fails to file a pre-hearing conference statement. Uh, there is no penalty to the claimant, but there is a penalty to the claimant's attorney. They don't get a fee on anything won at the pre-hearing conference. So that's one of those uh, rare situations where the claimant's attorney is actually penalized for some bad behavior. Uh, again, it doesn't affect the claimant, it just affects the, the attorney's fee. Oftentimes, if you can raise an a, uh, objection like that and ask for the penalty to be imposed, uh, you'll get some traction in the case and get an adversary to come talk to you about maybe settling the case. All right, I'm looking down here. I don't see any other questions right now. No more questions? I'm kind of surprised. Uh, we do have a lot of people on. Let me, I'll talk for just 30 more seconds and maybe another question will come in. I'll navigate away from this slide. Um, next month, we'll be talking about employer employee issues and defenses. We'll be talking about the independent contractor, special employment scenario, lent employees, all the different variations of employment in New York, including a discussion of PEOs and the special compensation situations that they can get themselves into or their employees into. Uh, so that will sort of restart or re-kick off our curriculum for the entire year. Our curriculum for this webinar runs essentially April to April. Let me click back and see. Karen asked the question, what is the purpose of pushing penalties on the employers? Why so heavy? Uh, well, they absolutely use penalties to shape our behavior. Payer compliance, when it came out in 2015 and started to get pushed, really came out as an effort uh, in response to uh, news articles and trade groups and union groups about the delay in getting that first payment out. It came out first um, as a, uh, hey, here's the thing we're going to do, and here's the thing we're starting to track, and then in 2017 became part of the statute, and the penalties began imposed statutorily. So absolutely, uh, the penalty system is used to shape and direct our behavior as employers and carriers. This system is skewed hopelessly towards the claimant. Um, it's one of the most claimant-friendly jurisdictions probably in the country. I bet you California's up there with New York. Uh, and I've had judges say the classic thing to me that they've said to all of you, Greg, it's workers' compensation, not employers' compensation. Uh, and they, you know, it, it, if there's a tie, um, the tie's going to go to the runner. And in this case, the tie is always the claimant. The judges are very predisposed to find in favor of the claimant, and the laws are intended to punish us, the employer carrier, for either raising defenses frivolously, being slow to pay, or when we are ordered to pay, not paying fast enough. All of this is intended to put more money in the pockets of the claimants. It does seem quite, quite uh, 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 onerous on the employers, uh, and is very different from, an, uh, from the, just even a neighboring state that we have a large practice in, which is New Jersey, where an employer uh, carrier penalty in New Jersey is extremely rare. Yeah, New Jersey does have some uh, fee shifting. Uh, for example, when you lose a motion for medical and temporary disability benefits, but really it's very rare to have a penalty in that jurisdiction. In New York, almost every case, it's almost impossible for your risk professional to do everything perfectly, and the board is designed to go after and look for these uh, penalty opportunities. So just absolutely that is their outlook. And this is a way that the board uh, raises money and funds itself. All right, uh, I'm glad I stayed on for just one more sec so I could get that question from Karen. And that's it for questions. All right, thanks for joining us today. Um, please join us next month for our discussion of em employer and employee relationship and defenses. Thanks everybody, see you next month.